This is part one of my favorite recommendations for 2021. In 2021, I emailed 157 art-related items to members of my free Sunday recommendations list. For supporters, I recommended 52 more items. The items in this and the following two posts are my personal favorites among those recommendations, and I've included the comments that I made when I recommended them. Included are 12 items that I originally shared only with supporters. Those are marked with two asterisks in the blog post. Novels. I have two tied for the winner. The first is S.J. Paris's Heresy 2010. I highly recommend this. It's the first book in a mystery series featuring Giordano Bruno, who lived from 1548 to 1600. Like most Renaissance scientists, including Galileo, whose life overlaps his, Bruno was a scientist with religious premises or a religious man eager to expand scientific knowledge. Today, Bruno is best known for extending Copernicus's work on the heliocentric solar system. Bruno proposed, for the first time as far as we know, that stars are distant suns surrounded by their own planets and that those planets might harbor living beings. He was outspoken in his theories on both religion and science. When patrons or colleagues disapproved, instead of quietly reversing his position, Bruno would just move on, from Naples to Venice, Padua to Lyon, Geneva to Paris, Wittenberg to Prague. In 1592, he was arrested by the Inquisition in Venice. Among the accusations against him were the fact that, counter to the Bible, he believed life might exist elsewhere than on Earth. Following eight years of imprisonment and trial, he was sentenced to be burned at the stake in the Campo dei Fiori in Rome. His character in heresy is intelligent and courageous. The novel is set in England in 1583, 50 years after Henry VIII declared himself head of the Church of England, 30 years after Bloody Mary reinstated Catholicism as the state religion, and 25 years after Elizabeth I's Oath of Supremacy required that anyone taking public or church office or teaching or studying at university should swear allegiance to the ruling monarch as the supreme governor of the Church of England. The dialogue near the end of this book between Bruno and the murderer, and I didn't guess who that murderer was, so kudos to the author, deals with religion versus science and life versus martyrdom. It is unusually thoughtful for a murder mystery. I approve of Bruno's definition of real heresy, which you'll have to read the book to find out. The Bruno series runs to seven volumes. Tying for first place under novels are the Murderbot Diaries series by Martha Wells, which began in 2017 and are still continuing. It is a series of five novels. You should start with All Systems Red. The part organic, part robot protagonist hacks his governor module so that he can act on his own volition. As a result, he has to choose his own values and deal with his own emotions. He's got a wry sense of humor and an apparently murderous past. I loved Murderbot so much that I read all the books aloud to my husband, and not many books make the cut for that. The runner-up in novels is Elizabeth Peters' Amelia Peabody series, which were written from 1975 to 2006. The main characters are Egyptologists in the late 19th century. There are 20 books in all. The reading on the audible versions by Barbara Rosenblatt is really top-notch. My favorite under-drama this year was Oscar Wilde's The Importance of Being Earnest, first performed in 1895. So many witty lines. If you prefer to see your plays performed rather than just read them, the most recent movie version from 2002 includes Colin Firth, Rupert Everett, and Judy Dench. Ayn Rand called Wilde a benevolent humorist in many of his plays, particularly The Importance of Being Earnest. That's from The Art of Fiction. All Wilde's plays are recommended by Leonard Peikoff as fun to read in the survival value of great, though philosophically false, art. Under short stories, the winner is Saki, H. H. Monroe, The Toys of Peace, published in 1919. Saki, a renowned British writer of short stories, is witty in the way that broken glass is beautiful, glittering and kind of dangerous. 
usually I restrict myself to reading a few of his stories at a time so the bitterness doesn't build up too much. This one, The Toys of Peace, seems very relevant in our time. I've given you a link in the blog post to my audio version of the story. Speaking of short stories, this year I finished my publication of the collected short works of Henry Kitchell Webster and related correspondence with volumes three and four. It turns out my favorite stories are in volume two, and my favorite play, Mrs. Thornborough's Apology, is in volume one. In December 2021, the Objective Standard published my article on Webster's Life and Works. The link to that is in the blog post. Moving on to poetry. I ask myself, which of the poems that I recommended last year do I most want you to reread or to read for the first time if you missed a week's recommendations? I ended up with eight poems in this order. Incidentally, one of my subscribers suggested that I compile an anthology of poems that I'd recommended. That's actually in the works, and it's what made me start thinking about order and flow rather than just listing poems. So, the first of the eight poems is Lord Byron's The Isles of Greece, 1819. Byron sees the ghosts of greatness and urges the Greeks to fight to live up to their past. You could think of this as a longer version of Dagny's Don't Let It Go at the end of part two of Atlas Shrugged. I had an inspiration for how to present this with annotations in a video. I've given you a link to that. But right here, I just want to tell you my favorite lines from it. The mountains look on Marathon, and Marathon looks on the sea. And musing there an hour alone, I dream that Greece might still be free. For standing on the Persian's grave, I could not deem myself a slave. Second poem is Edward Rowland Sills, The Reformer. My favorite lines from this one are, When the red dust has cleared, the lonely soldier stands with strange thoughts beneath the friendly stars. Next up is Goethe's Prometheus, written 1772 to 74. The translation that I'm using is from Wikipedia, which will also give you the German original if you read German. My favorite lines from this one are, Cover your heavens, Zeus, with gauzy clouds, and practice like a boy who beheads thistles on the oaks and peaks of mountains. But you must allow my world to stand, and my hut, which you did not build, and my hearth, whose glow you envy me. Next one is Victor Hugo's Victor Sed Victus, Victor but Vanquished, from 1877. By the early 1870s, Hugo was a towering figure in the French literary world and an intransigent voice in French politics as well. In 1871, he became the guardian of his grandchildren, Jeanne and Georges. At a time when children were still expected to be seen and not heard, his indulgent treatment of his grandchildren shocked his contemporaries. One of Hugo's last public works was The Art of Being a Grandfather, 1877. The title of this poem is a Latin pun, because Victor is Hugo's name, as well as the Latin word for conqueror. My rough translation aims at content rather than style, since writing in rhyming couplets or even in meter is beyond my literary skills. A couple of my favorite lines, it was really tough to choose for this. When tyrants were throwing from on high their black thunder with crimes for lightning bolts, I threw my somber verse on those passing dangerous men. Next up, Henry Lawson, the man who raised Charlestown. My favorite lines from this one, again there are many, and a thrill went through the city ere the drums began to roll, and the coward found his courage, and the drunkard found his soul. So a thrill went through the city, that would go through all the land, for the quiet man from Buckland held men's hearts in his right hand. Next one is Henry Wadsworth Longfellow's The Arrow and the Song. There's a reason it's a classic. This one appeals to me especially because people often don't tell me until years after I've given a lecture or published a book or sent an email that they loved that particular one, which is what I get for not writing on topical subjects. Favorite lines. I breathed a song into the air, it fell to earth I knew not where, for who has sight so keen and strong that it can follow the flight of song? Next up, Edward Rowland Sill, The Open Window. Favorite lines, 
All the while I had burrowed there in my dingy tower, though the birds had sung and the leaves had danced from hour to sunny hour. And finally, Burton Braley, Merchant Adventurers. Favorite lines. Don't you believe it. That spirit is glowing under the businessman's vest. Jasons of trade are still joyously going forth on a magical quest. Gambling with fate, burning bridges behind them, wagering all in the till. Bucking the world for a profit, you'll find them. Merchant adventurers still. And now we move on to blog posts. My blog posts are frequently about artworks in museums that I visited because writing the posts gives me the chance to revisit favorite works when I'm no longer on site. So this year's favorites include Enchanted, a History of Fantasy Illustration, an exhibition at the Norman Rockwell Museum in Stockbridge, Massachusetts, that included these two works. Also, I visited Chesterwood, the home of Daniel Chester French in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. There's a five-part series on that. Also, I visited for the first time the Ringley Museum in Sarasota, Florida, three parts to that, and I finished my series on the Wadsworth Athenaeum in Hartford, Connecticut, with 20 parts. <laughs> uh, next week we will move on to favorite recommendations from 2021 in painting and sculpture. Meanwhile, just summing up what I wrote this year, I published the financial programs of Alexander Hamilton by a farmer's daughter. It required a massive amount of research and writing, but I'm very glad that I did it, and delighted that it has received such positive comments. Also out this year are the last two volumes of my edition of Henry Kitchell Webster's Collected Short Works and Related Correspondence. DianeDurantyWriter.com has hundreds of posts on sculpture, painting, architecture, and my other obsessions. To join the free Sunday Recommendations email list, visit the URL that's on the screen or email me. And you can say, well done, Diane, or support my work and receive rewards by means of the tip jar on DianeDurantyWriter.com. As always, thank you for listening.